Hello and welcome to IG's Trading the Markets podcast. I'm Victoria Scholar and this week we're here to talk about the commercial property market with Matt Howard. He's a director and fund manager from BMO. Matt works for BMO's Commercial Property Trust, which is a vehicle for investors who want to get exposure to prime UK commercial property. It's a constituent of the FTSE 250 and BMO says that it aims to provide shareholders with an attractive level of income together with the potential for capital and income growth. Matt, great to chat to you. This year clearly has been an absolute whirlwind in terms of the commercial property market. How challenging has it been for you guys? Well, I think I think the challenge and the and, and the crisis of the last year really has been one of one of income. You know, if you reverse to this time last year, um, it was an extraordinary period of uncertainty. Um, we really didn't know what the consequences were of what we were going through, and I think that uh, that evolved quite quickly. You know, obviously we're we're still very clearly not out of the woods, but if you go back to um, say the middle of the summer. There was a lot more certainty in in terms of managing all of this. But if we go back a year, you know, we really didn't know what it meant for the businesses and for our occupiers. So really what we've seen over the last year was a a challenge of income. And, um, you know, we have a duty to our to our clients to 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 collect rents uh, first and foremost. Um, But we also had to be flexible and sympathetic to those retailers that that needed some support. So if you look at Q2, 3 and 4 for last year, um, the quarters of the pandemic, uh, we collected about 88% of of all rents due. Uh, For Q1 of 2021, we're up to about 84%. So um, although that's that's a a relatively significant amount of income, it's nowhere near as bad as it uh, originally um, was feared and reflects quite well against other uh, balanced commercial portfolios. Um, but in terms of, of, of capital values and, and how properties performed overall, uh, commercial property in the UK has been relatively resilient um, despite the headwinds. You know, we saw, we did see capital falls last year of about 6% across the uh, investable universe measured by MSCI. And now bearing in mind, most of those downward movements were skewed by the retail sector. You know, shopping centres fell almost 30% last year, retail warehousing about 15 and retail overall was about, about minus 17. Um, whereas the other sectors uh, like uh, industrial was, was plus 5% in terms of capital value. So we saw a dispersion of returns, but it, when you compare minus 6% against the global financial crisis where over a 18 month period capital values fell 33%, um, then it's held up relatively well. That's really interesting what you're saying about the fact that what we're seeing now in terms of COVID hasn't necessarily hit as bad as um, the financial crisis over 10 years ago. But you talked about uh, the retail sector there. Obviously, we've seen such big changes, retail in a really difficult spot this year and last. Um, And we have seen our shopping habits change. A lot of us switching to e-commerce and online shopping. Is this a trend that you think will reverse and will go back to shopping on the high street? Or is this here to stay? Well, it's here to stay. Um, I don't think it will reverse. And and what we've seen um, across many macro trends is an acceleration, really. You know, if you take uh, take e-commerce and you go to the end of 2019, online retail accounted for approximately 19%, one nine, of all UK retail sales. Uh, and what we saw last year, that that figure jumped to 35%. Uh, and going forward, uh, most forecasters and, and us at BMO, we expect that to settle around 30%. Now, that 19% I mentioned a second ago, that has grown uh, steadily uh, by around one, one and a half to two percent every year since 2008. So it wasn't something which had accelerate had accelerated in recent times. It was just a, a steady chipping away. And and really, what we've seen is um, a breaking down of cultural barriers. You know, habits which will now last a lifetime for many. But if you flip that on its head, you know, if you say uh, online sales 30 percent uh, this year, um, you know, that's that's going to grow. That still means that 70% of all sales are are in um, physical stores. And and what we've really seen in the last few years is, you know, we've we've had a number of retail casualties really starting, um, the the, the current cycle really started in 2018, you know, and we we lost a few tenants on on our park, such as, you know, home base, pound world uh, and mother care. Um, But what we've seen also over that time is certain retailers that have um, set up set themselves up um, with their new omni-channel business models where um, there's synergies between the online offer 
and their physical offer. And we're seeing some fantastic business models, sustainable models, which are um, going to put these businesses in um, long term health. You know, some of the some of the tenants we've we've attracted on our parks, um, not necessarily online online retailer, but we had Lidl replace the home base store at Newbury. Um, we attracted MS to replace the home base at, in Solihull. You know, back at Newbury, we've we've uh, pulled in Hobbycraft, uh, Dykeman Shoes, um, and the former Next and New Look stores. We've just signed up another agreement for lease, which we can't yet announce, but it will be be known fairly soon. Um, so what we're seeing is is a, a lot of businesses, um, a really a polarisation, if you will, between the successful retail businesses, which are setting themselves up for the for the new world, uh, versus those which were um, uh, really heading in in the wrong direction. And the pandemic essentially was the um, uh, last nail in the coffin, as it were. So it's essentially a, kind of an uh, expediting a trend that we've already seen, and and the same goes really for um, working patterns. I mean, I know I'm working at home right now. Matt, you are as well. And we don't know when we're going to be going back to the office. And when we do go back to the office, whether or not that will be full time or if now we're going to be living in this world where it's half at home, half at work. Um, it's just interesting that this has been such a massive theme over the last year. And I wanted to get your thoughts about what happens post COVID. Yeah, certainly. And, um, you know, I think I think the, the world has changed. We've heard that quite a few times uh, recently. Um, but again, to use a term I, I, I used a second ago, it's, a, it's another acceleration. You know, home working, mm. remote working has been around um, uh, feasibly 20 years since the connectivity has really been there. And, and some businesses have been um, leading the charge and some weren't. And there were, again, cultural barriers um, to that, um, which, again, has have been broken down. And again, if we jump back a, a, a year, you know, I think people were astounded by how successful home working was and so appreciative frankly, that it was there as an option to replace the office because we had no choice at that time. Um, and there were certain corporates, um, quite well known large businesses, which were making quite grand statements about the restructuring of their, their office present going, presence going forward. Um, and since then, we have seen a, a, a backtracking of that um, and the dust has settled a little bit. And I think what we're seeing now is there will definitely be more of a hybrid model um, most surveys that we've seen and, and, and speaking to tenants firsthand have said they expect perhaps, say, two days working from home a week. Um, and what we think that the shape of that, where we, where we think that will go is probably at the beginning of the week, maybe a Monday and the end of the week on a Friday will be the time that people are, are more likely to be at home, setting themselves up or wrapping up for the week. Um, and in the middle part, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays in particular will be maybe where there'd be an ac an accent uh, of, of people in the office for that human human interaction, peak days, if you will. So therefore, say, you know, if you're in the office on average 60 percent of the time on a Wednesday, say, you're still going to have to cater for about 80 percent of your staff on that day, which is not unusual, not 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 different to perhaps where it was was before. So you're still going to have to have that, that office presence. I think most businesses. Um, are very clear now that the office is still the, the central, the heartbeat of that business. And if you look at the actual physical office itself, I think the actual um, physical changes will be uh, more meeting rooms, more screens, more cameras. There'll be uh, hybrid meetings uh, where you have, say, say six people in a meeting, three might be at home, three might be in the office. So the people in the office they will, will go off to a pod to have that call. They won't necessarily just sit at their desk and speaking into a camera to somebody else who's on a camera the other side of their office. So it's going to have to be more flexible. There'll be more meeting room, more, more interactions. I think what this has stopped is people just commuting an hour a day or combined two hours a day, if not more, to, to churn out a load of emails and go home. So I think it's uh, it's about making making the working week slightly different um, and, and getting the best of, 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 of both worlds, really. Um, what I would also say on, on home working, a topic that uh, was a real challenge uh, generally was, um, you know, the UK's uh, the pressure on the UK's public infrastructure, trains, the road network. We've all experienced that firsthand, um, and also uh, a, a movement towards reducing carbon emissions. Well, spending an extra day or two from home really supports that. So there are some real positives, um, residual positives, to come out of uh, the last year, which I think will uh, which will play out um, as as we move back to the office in some parts over the course of 2021. 
Okay, so can you tell us a bit more about your commercial property trust? What's your sort of um, investment horizon? What are you focusing on and, and what are the target sectors? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're, we're uh, as I said, at the, the top of the conversation, we're, uh, we, we look at generally high quality, uh, well-located core and core plus real estate. Um, it's a balanced portfolio. Um, so we have exposure to to all sectors um, and we're a long term investor. So it's it's patient capital. It's looking at long term um, macro trends. Um, one of the take, for example, one of the, the assets in the portfolio is, is St. Christopher's Place. It's the most well known known asset. It's considered a, a retail slash leisure asset, but really it's mixed use. It has exposure to offices, residential uh, food and beverage and also also retail um, and that's a good example of a, of a property which um, has a, a long-term investment horizon you know being located in, in core central London um, you're not always going to go through periods of of um, significant uh, rental growth there's always going to be periods of of challenge in terms of some of the uh, the the retail holdings which we are seeing at the moment um, but again it's a, it's a longer term holding you know does one think that uh, St Christopher's Place is going to be a thriving estate in, in 10 years 20 years time of course it is um, you know if you look at that property individually the last year has been particularly challenging you know, all the virtues of that estate have have turned on its head through the pandemic you know it's in central London uh, it relies on tourism particularly from overseas uh, it relies on uh, the office workforce, uh, the population of the office workforce um, using the estate and, of course, public transport. So all these things are, are playing against it at the moment. Um, but we have uh, Crossrail opening in the middle of, of next year, middle to latter part of next year. You know, we've got investors who have spent the last uh, 5, 10, 20 years of their investment philosophy investing around Crossrail stations. You know, and that, that finally opens uh, hopefully next year. So that's uh, that's 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 massive and could be transformative for that um, that stretch of Oxford Street, and that's a really good example of of um, uh, you know why we've held this asset for the long term and and where we see uh, positivity in the future. And um, we've 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 done lease deals in the past year on the estate. You know, for example, we've signed San Carlo Group, the restaurant group, to replace the old Carluccio's unit for one of the most prominent. Uh, restaurants on the estate. We've done a number of office listings of late. So, so the world keeps turning. So that's, as I say, that's St Christopher's Place. And in on, on the rest of the estate, you know, I've mentioned uh, mentioned the retail warehouses and 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 what's happening there. Our, our overall void rate is is very low at the moment. Uh, we have a strong industrial portfolio that we're looking to increase our exposure to that sector over the next couple of years, and we certainly see further growth uh, in industrial. Um, over the short and, and medium term horizon. So, as I say, we look at um, long term macro trends and we're a, a long term investor. OK, so as someone who is very plugged into the long term macro trends, your sector is a real bellwether for the economy. So give us a sense of your economic outlook for the UK. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think um, we're we're in for uh, a, a low growth environment in the next couple of years. You know there are consequences from um, the, the constraints of of the past twelve months, um, but I think you know the, the the UK is 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 on a pretty strong footing. You know if you look at the the occupiers in 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 most of our assets across all sectors, you know most of those businesses are in are in good shape and 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 looking. Quite positively towards um, towards the next couple of years. You know, if you look at, at real estate, uh, real estate as a, as an investment class uh, tends to offer as an alternative tends to offer a yield pickup against um, other alternative investment classes, and and um, you know offering a long term income return of around five percent with the hope of some some capital growth there. And and we think that will be sustained over over the near term. Um, but we do think it's a it's a low growth environment. So for us. That is exactly why we invest in a in a core portfolio. It's to show uh, resilience in in a downturn or in periods when the markets under are under distress. But I think we're going to see um, we're going to see general growth in the in the UK economy, um, but with with some caution and of course uh, dealing with the consequences of the past year. All right, that's all we have time for in this week's episode. Thank you so much to my guest Matt Howard. He's a fund manager from BMO. And thank you to everyone for listening to IG's Trading the Markets podcast. And if you enjoyed it, please don't forget to subscribe.
For more videos like these, subscribe to our YouTube channel, IG UK, and make sure to follow us on Twitter. We're at IGTV.